Welcome uh, to today's lecture. Uh, we are continuing with the historic cities and heritage areas part 3. In our last lecture, we have been discussing that how uh, over uh, the last few decades, the emphasis of conservation has been shifting from monument centering conservation to the historic areas and historic districts. We will talk about that, we will continue with that development and the, whatever the conventions and charters which were formulated for this particular aspect. While discussing that, uh, we have discussed several charters, Amsterdam, Declaration of Amsterdam and other. Today, we will uh, continue with that with the Washington Charter, which is the charter on the conservation of historic towns and urban areas. It was in 1987. Remember, we have been discussing about the main city program in America. Uh, so, uh, there are very specific types of conservation programs which are very emphasis to gives to the commercial development. We have discussed that. So, let us see what the Washington Charter is an international charter which have talked about the historic uh, towns and urban areas. It gives the principles and guidelines for protection and conservation of historic towns. It complements the Venice Charter. It is not in violation of the Venice Charter, but it complements the Venice Charter whose emphasis was on the individual monument. Let us take this uh, example. This is a historic town of Udo Preto, a UNESCO World Heritage Site in Brazil. As you can see that this uh, small town or city it is uh, located on a hilltop in an hilly area. There is a monument which probably is a fort or a palace. There are the churches, but in addition to that there is a common areas, the residential area, the commercial area along with the open spaces and the hills in the background, this in totality forms a historic area. And preservation of such area or if there is any significance of such area, it cannot be done in isolation because as a whole this town has its own significance which also is integrated with the natural city. So, the issues addressed in the Washington Charter to address this type of uh, aspects and uh, the areas, integration of preservation objectives into the planning policies. We can't tackle this type of uh, issues without considering the overall planning. Qualities of historic towns that should be preserved. What makes these qualities? participation of residents in the preservation process because it's, we are no longer talking only about monuments, palaces or churches or religious buildings. We are also talking about the normal residential area for a lived in city. The social and economic aspects of the human uh, historic town preservation. Naturally, when we are talking about the residents, we have to consider the social and economic aspects and these are the areas uh, or issues which have been addressed in the Washington Charter. So, let us see the integration of preservation objectives into the planning policies. So, this was the main focus of uh, Washington Charter. Let us talk about a city, Olinda, which is a city in Brazil. You can see that it is a city which is located on a sea. It was founded in the 16th century by the Portuguese. The town's history is linked to the sugarcane industry. So, there is an economic factor which shaped this town. It was rebuilt after being looted by the Dutch. So, it has a multi layers of history. Its basic urban fabric dates back from the 18th century. So, what is the significance of this particular town which is a world heritage site or city? The harmonious balance between the buildings, the gardens, the 20 Baruch churches, Baruch churches, convents and numerous small passos or chapels all contribute to Olinda's particular charm. So, we can't think of preservation of this charm if that is the significance without considering the natural aspect, without considering all the fabric and the activities and the open spaces and natural factors within that. So, it is not only the monuments, it is lesser important buildings, 
they may be secret, they may be residential, may be commercial and the urban pattern and the natural aspects all contribute to the charm of these historic towns and also which is related to the past economic potential or activities of uh, how it has grown, how it was destroyed and rebuilt all con has contributed, all these factors have contributed to the development of this town. So, this uh, streetscape what you find there and you can see the uh, uh, one of the monument in the far away and the topography, the, the, the how the sloping of the ground uh, it has contributed to the total built form. So, the, what is the significance of this town? Charming simplicity of the houses painted in vivid colors or faced with ceramic tiles, located in an informal wave of streets and alleyways and set within a lush tropical forest landscape overlooking the ocean that differentiates this town and gives its unique character. So, when we are talking about these towns or historic areas, we have to find out that what are the aspects, what are the factors, what are the attributes which are contributing to that unique character of these towns or historic areas and that all of this combined, if we have a thinking of preservation of that, all of this combined have to be preserved. But the challenge is these are very lived in towns, people stay there. A, 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 a town or a place lived in place is a dynamic entity. So, how do we take care of that? To take care of that naturally it is not only important to understand the attributes which has formed this unique identity, but also we need to understand that what are the instruments both administrative and management through which this preservation of that charm or the unique identity of that place can be maintained or can be implemented. So, let us see in this particular town what are the instruments or what did happen so that we still can find that the charm is maintained and the unique character of the town has been maintained. So, first was that a number of inscription designating the historical site of Olinda as a Brazilian cultural heritage site. So, this designation is an official process, it is an legal tool by which it has to be identified and first that it is an important historical site. In this particular case, it was implemented by the federal government through IFAN National Institute of Historical and Artistic Heritage and this differs from country to country, place to place that what will be this organization institute which are capable or which have the authority or jurisdiction to enforce this type of implements. But what is important is that is the federal government which has inscribed through a series of uh, inscription or legal instruments that it is an historical site. In 1979, there was a federal notification delimiting the protected site and the surrounding area. So, one was the designation and then it sort of given a boundary. This boundary or delimiting that area, boundary definition is also has to be done through very scientific process. Third, the municipal, the first one was done by the federal government, it is something like our central government. The municipal preservation system that is the local authority created by means of a municipal law consisting of a foundation council composed of the representatives of the municipal, state and federal governments and preservation trust fund. So, what we can see that at one level, higher level it was a federal government uh, which did the inscription and then there was a federal uh, notification which is the top level one which sort of decided that what will be the boundary and then the municipal that has been the local authority, but through a municipal law it implemented, but again it was a composed of foundation, a council both at the state level and the federal law as well as a preservation trust fund. So, there the economy is coming into the picture. 
National monument designation conferred by the state in 1980 with a view to protecting the site's physical assets in recognition of its history, art and landscape. So, there is a series of steps which were taken either in terms of legal or administrative or financial resources to make it happen. Various administrative and management instruments what we have been discussing. The monumental program and IPHAN which we have talked about, they also after that did a lot of urban renovation measures on a broad scale. Allocation of public funding to private properties, so as we can see that in such historic cities it is not only the public property, there are a lot of private properties of the owners and how to make them take part in this preservation or conservation process. So, in this case the allocation of public funding to private properties for the purpose of preserving and restoring historical housing structure. This is a very important part if you have to think of uh, in a historic city or district. Then on a broad scale there was in renovation measures, but in action plan for the historic cities in 2010 where federal and state institutions to support the development, restoration and revitalization of historic cities in the country. So, this action plan for the historic cities 2001, it was not only for this particular city, it was done at a broader level, at the top level, but this particular city became a part of that and benefited out of this uh, new instrument. Now, so we have seen that how the significant attributes of a very charming city has been preserved through a series of legal, financial and administrative implements. We have been talking about the different types of policies which has been happening. We have talked about the declaration of Amsterdam, we have talking about the Nairobi, we have talked about the Washington Charter. Let us talk about another approach which actually is known as the Italian practice of preserving the historic city which also has gone through the different stages of development which is talking about basically the focus is on historized urban fabric. There is a debate on the notion of center historical or the historic center vis-a-vis -vis the policies for the entire territory perceived as historical because when we are talking about a historic center we have to understand it belongs to a part of a larger territory. If you do not take the territory into consideration, then it this historic center even if you preserve it, it remain in isolation, there has to be a continuity. So, this approach or the Italian debate which happened uh, through the several case studies, we, we have seen some examples where this continuity between a historic center vis-a-vis -vis the territory uh, has been taken into consideration and that requires a systematic analysis. What are these analysis about? One is the qualities of the historic center and protection of the surrounding landscape as an essential part of the urban planning laws because on one hand we are talking about a micro scale, a small scale, a historic town, historic district and other, but we have to remember as we say that it is a part of a larger territory. So, the protection of the surrounding landscape is an entire uh, process and an essential part which has to be taken into consideration and it can be done only through proper urban planning norms. A very good example of this is in Assisi Italy as you can see that it is again on a mountain it has its chapels a very important touristic place and it is surrounded by a landscape which is also an integral part of this Assisi. Assisi master plan is known for the preserving this quality that is why we still it is so important. The Assisi master plan when it was developed to that according to that Italian practice, it had precise tools to analyze the physical, economic, social structure of the city and its environment. So, we are not only talking about the physical, but we have been talking about the economic, the social structure of the city and its entire environment. The relationship or interlinkage of the historic center with the surrounding is also important. And as a follow up of that, the specification of urban policies linked to general social and economic development plan. 
and this is what is integrated urban conservation. We have to see as a regional context the surrounding what is happening, integrate the role, function, social structure, economics of that small area and find out the linkage how it is happening with the surrounding and then only we can talk about integrating uh, preservation with the development. Another very uh, uh, when we are talking about the Italian practice, uh, another very well known example is Volona, which is known for its romantic streetscape. It is a visually harmonious combination of residential tissue interposed with large building palaces, convents and churches. So, you can see that when we are talking about this that we are uh, that entire fabric which has a very unique characteristics, but it uh, there is an urban tissue which is there. Let us see how uh, what it was and how the various planning policies and development policies had been uh, imported there to keep it like that. And not only keep it like that, is we are not talking about preservation, but making it a living, prospering urban entity. In 1960s, the center of Bologna, that was the condition. It was a very poor physical condition. Most of the housing were substandard. The indigenous population, we are, they were living there for generation, but due to this poor condition, the younger generation were living. So, there was an out migration of the younger generation. In 1969, a new master plan of the city was formulated. Overall, now even when we are talking about the master plan, master plan also has changed over the years in its concept and in its purpose. Earlier the master plan was strictly the land use control. Over the years it has more shifted towards the strategic planning. So, in 1969 when the new master plan of the city was formulated, the, there was an overall long range program of development and necessary intervention to preserve both the container and the content. What is this container and what is this content? Container is the fabric and content is the life, the people, the activities. So, let us see how in case of Bologna it has been done. What they have talked about this sort of uh, to, took this aim that Bologna the conservation is revolution. It is perceived as an alternative to the new speculative development and further peripheral development of the city. What is happening that a lot of the speculators and developers and the, the really privately owned landlords within the city core, a lot of speculation was happening and a lot of demolition was happening. So, we cannot think of anything for this historic town and city until and unless we also think in integration with the larger area that where this new development will happen, which direction. Uh, what will be the new types of housing. So, without integrating that we cannot only talk in isolation about the historic center. So, when the Bologna conservation plan was done, it was seen in totality with the future new development for the city as a whole. Environment and inhabitants both are important. Improving physical environment is important. Increasing the level of services and amenities is important. Promoting democratic participation in all decision making are important. So, these are the key issues or key points which were addressed when Bologna's this conservation on revolution is happening. You can see there this is still a living city where people are staying, the apartments are there, there are the local markets. And the principal aim for this conservation in revolution is the total rehabilitation and restoration of the existing built fabric of the city together with adequately integrated social services and requirement and creation of more livable environment. So, 
one can see that how the emphasis has been shifting from monument centric conservation to making these places a livable environment, not a tourist oriented place, a place where people lived. There may be the tourists, there may be the facilities for tourists, but the main aim was to make it a livable city where the local train, uh, local people uh, can sustain. So, in this case, uh, it is very well known one, this Bologna's uh, plan, conservation plan. The guidelines for methodology of the urban renovation was done by Leonardo Venevolo. He is a very well known planner and historian. The plan which he formulated was based on comprehensive and a thorough survey of buildings and open spaces. So, one once we are talking about the development of such historic towns and revitalization or rehabilitation is we are not talking of only the monuments, measure drawing of the monuments and taking care of the restoration or preservation of the monuments. The information about the entire urban fabric has to be there. So, it is based on a comprehensive and a thorough survey of the buildings and open spaces, the activities, their state of preservation, importance and significance. So, this is one of the maps which have been prepared where it shows the building typologies uh, which is prepared in the 19th. So, the different types of buildings which are there courtyard type or apartment type. So, there are various categorization and this was actually demarcated on the plan and there were various thematic plans which are being prepared based on a thorough survey and documentation. As we said, the architecture typology facade and the style of building characteristics to be preserved as part of the historic area. So, these types of plans and documentation give an idea of that. Overbuilt and unattractive areas identified for private investment is not that each and every area has to be preserved. Definitely, there will be the new development, new infill. We have to come in. There are areas which are very deteriorated. We have to think about that. It can only be done when we have a proper documentation of the area, documentation of the status of preservation, documentation about the ownership, documentation about that the, the residents, their social and demographic structure, the age of the structure, the character of the structure. The, all of these have to be done thematically. Now, coming to the instrument, in 1973 law enabled authorities to expropriate vacant buildings and those at risk. Now, I am just taking the major points, there are also a series of other laws which were there, but 1973 law author, uh, enabled the authorities to occupy the vacant buildings and those at risk. So, this is also a very important tool and at which price the market prices or the lower than the market prices this all has to be very clearly spelt out. Now, this is what has happened uh, as you can see that this is a street view of the restored and the new infill housing facades from 1970s in a particular area of Balana uh, which is a very lived in area and it is not that they are all old, but they are infill development, the new buildings in whole settings which has come and where people continue to stay in a proper livable condition. For this to happen, there was a detailed rehabilitation plan and which can only be done in a combination not only of the physical planning, but also economic measures and administrative tools, proper legal tools. In this case, there was a program, program of subsidy to protect the tenants from the rent increase and eviction because we talked about that in such cases most of the time these areas become a tourist towns and uh, converted into hotels and homestay. It is not that they will be there, but if the entire fabric is converted into a tourist town then we do not find the original resident for that some protection is necessary otherwise gentrification happen. So, we can see that here a program of subsidy was instituted. Uh, against uh, for protection of the tenants. Private owners were guaranteed subsidy for rehabilitation on a sliding scale in lieu of offer of rented accommodation. So, that means when the private owners they were given a subsidy, but it was a conditional subsidy that they have to take care of that, they can take care of that or they will get the subsidy only when certain conditions are fulfilled and this has to be done as a policy level. 
As a result of this, Bologna is one of the Italy's most preserved historical center after Venice. What has happened? What is the outcome of that? Better physical condition, social composition changed to more students and single person household, center of tertiary users, housing, university activities, cultural and tourist function, small trades and business and industry shifted to the outskirts. This type of development as we can see that we have talked about in a very, um, I have given this only a summary of what has happened, but you can see that it is a combination of the financial tools, administrative rules and regulation, a policy uh, which is combined out to subsidy, protection of the residents, conditional subsidy, all of this have to be combined together and then uh, occupation uh, of the vacant plots a very deteriorated state so that new areas can come, new development can come up. It is not only a, to convert into a touristic town, but a place where it will be a continuous. Uh, the original residence, original residence means not always the original residence and their descendant, but the people of the city, the student community and other, they make it a, a lived in place and not only dependent totally on the floating population. So, this is what has made the Bologna a very successful uh, conservation plan, an integrated conservation plan, which is uh, a result of a series of steps which has been taken. We will in our next lecture, we will continue with that, that how these type of instruments and activities and policies can be implemented in other areas. Thank you.